and I want to say that I'm a proud member of Fort William First Nation and I love I love Fort William I love Thunder Bay uh, I write a lot about Thunder Bay uh, about what's happened to our people in that area and Treaty 9 you know Robinson Superior Treaty Treaty number three area all of the north really because I love it I love where my mom's family is from but I always feel most comfortable back home. I always feel most comfortable um, in the north, for sure. And it is the air, the land, my nation, that really actually fuels all of my writing, everything. Um, my activism, everything I do, really. My books, um, my production company, podcasts, everything comes from that place. Quay Nindaluizi Pampometer, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. I'm a lawyer, professor, author, and activist from Eel River Bar First Nation, and my motto is education for action on Indigenous rights, social justice, and protecting the planet. And on this podcast, you're going to get an education of an entirely different kind, one that's enriched by the cultures, insights, and experiences of Indigenous authors, artists, actors, musicians, academics, as well as leaders, activists, land defenders, and water protectors, all of whom are on the front lines of Indigenous resistance, resurgence, and revitalization. And today's episode is really the gold standard. And I know before it even starts, it's already going to be one of my favorites. I feel like we're going to learn so much today and it's free advice and guidance and information and education. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss this. Welcome back to the Warrior Life Podcast. I'm your host, Pam Palmeter. Today, I get to talk to an Indigenous woman whose name you see everywhere. She's doing everything she can to share Indigenous voices and stories. Tanya Talaga is a woman on fire. I don't know how else to describe her. She is literally dominating everything she does. She is one of the most amazing people I know, or I'm, at least I'm going to pretend that I know her and just brag and, you know, be famous by association. She has two best-selling books already. The kind of books that everyone talks about, we use in our university classes, every Canadian's reading. She wrote regular columns for the Toronto Star for 20 years, like 20 years. That's two decades and now she writes for the globe and mail which is massive but you know that's not enough for her no 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 no. she's got so much extra time that she also heads an indigenous production company and has created an award-winning documentary and just when i think i know tanya she goes and produces a podcast which just ends up being one of my favorite podcasts and oh wait this just in she has a third book coming out this summer like yes i can't wait to read this welcome to the warrior life podcast tanya <laughs> Mishu and Migwitch for having me. I'm like, wow, who's this person you're describing? Is this person me? It can't be. No way. No way. And like, talk about a woman on fire. That's you. That's you. Oh, you you're know? so sweet. Oh, no, it's I, true. I, I, I'm so like, excited to have you here. But you have to pass a test before we can go any further. And it's the pretendian test. How do we know you're actually native? Wow, that's a hard one, isn't it? But you know, I'm lactose intolerant. Oh, like, that's yeah, there's one right there. Right. And then I like raisins in my butter tart. Oh, you got that one. <laughs> and I got a status card. You know, oh, just goes usually yes. I was going to wear it on my forehead today, just in case. But you know, it's in the there wallet. There you go. 
Okay, yeah. good. I've got my pretendian checklist down. <laughs> Don't have to private any of these podcasts. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. I know you're insanely busy and everybody, I get so many requests to have you on this podcast mm -hmm. and I just keep responding. I know I want her on the podcast too. I'm trying. And finally, like, I feel like I deserve an award for this <laughs> epic pursuit and journey to get Tanya on my podcast. And here you are. Thank you so much. No, no, honestly, the honor's mine. I've always wanted to sit down and actually just really talk to you um, since I first met you. And I don't know if you remember, but I was a journalist at the Toronto Star at the time. And I interviewed you on Young Street. It was, oh my gosh, was it after the Glad do verdict or was it there was something that happened and i there was a yeah. march just suddenly like yeah. we were like it was like an um almost like an idol no more and we we're yeah. all out the street like and i raced up from i was at one young street and you must have been around tmu and i saw you and it was the first time i actually saw you in the flesh and i was like so nervous to talk to you <laughs> and i remember getting some quotes from you which were nice. epic. and I ran back and I put them in my story and that's forever now we are forever attached that's, that's fantastic great. news <laughs> that, when was that was a while ago I'm gonna say oh my gosh, oh gosh. over years and years. Years. years and years years like, yeah. and years yeah mm -hmm. I mean I we don't look old or anything but Not it was it. years and years ago it was a long time mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well before we get started can you talk a little bit about uh, your First Nation, the nation you come from, a little bit about the culture, the territory, just to kind of give everyone some context? For sure. Um, and I want to say that I'm a proud member of Fort William First Nation. And I love, I love Fort William. I love Thunder Bay. Uh, I write a lot about Thunder Bay, uh, about what's happened to our people in that area and Treaty 9, you know, Robinson Superior Treaty, Treaty Number 3 area, all of the North really, because I love it. I love where my mom's family is from. And I am of course mixed. My father was Polish, Polish Canadian. Um, so my mom, my mom is Anishinaabe. She was raised on the traditional territory of Fort William First Nation. I love it there, you know, um, I feel at home there. I uh, was raised in the city, so my mom left when she was quite young. Um, my sister had been um, taken away, had been um, put into the adoption system, um, and I was raised in Toronto. Uh, my mom met and married my dad, and that's how that came to be. But I always feel most comfortable back home. I always feel most comfortable um, in the North, for sure. And it is the air, the land, my nation that really actually fuels all of my writing, everything. Um, my activism, everything I do, really, my books, um, my production company, the podcasts, Everything comes from that place, I think, and from my my mother's experience uh, growing up there. Her brothers were also in the '60s scoop, and it's um, it's it's formed everything, really. To be honest with you, um, yeah. And I wish I could be there all the time. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's hard when you're you make your life in the city. You've made your life in the city. Mm -hmm. I wish. I could spend more time up north, 100%. I really do. Um, but it's hard, you know. Life gets hard. Commitment, yeah. children, you know, and children that are going to school, um, trying to go to school, children that need, I don't know, support. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, and I think a lot of us feel that way because not all of us obviously live on reserve or mm -hmm. were raised on and off or just off mm -hmm. because of a whole bunch of different things, foster care, adoptions, residential schools, Indian hospital. I mean, the, the whole gambit of things. Right. And so, we, you know, there's a, 
you always feel you always know when you're home. And one of the things I like most about you is that you have brought sunshine or a spotlight to Thunder Bay in a way that wasn't done before, because I don't have to tell you the issues in Thunder Bay, the racism, the violence, uh, the mistreatment of Native people, that never got national attention. You mm -hmm. know, things just kept happening. But you, I mean, you're writing from your home and it's, and it's very mm -hmm. clear that you, you care very much about Thunder Bay. Do you get a lot of response sure. from people in Thunder Bay about, about the new kind of attention, newish. Yeah, uh, yes, <laughs> both good and bad. Um, mostly, I have to say, good uh, from our people for sure. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people always come up to me and are thankful for the books mm -hmm. that I write and um, uh, the speaking that I do, talking about uh, what's been going on in Thunder Bay and surrounding area forever. I mean, you know, if you're from that area, you know, your, your mom's grown up there with her own stories and you hear the stories, you know, your, your grandparents, like you just, you know what it's like in Thunder Bay and the divide in the city, you know, the, the red face and the white face of Thunder Bay. Um, and it was, uh, it's interesting, you know, some people love me in Thunder Bay and some people don't. Um, but mostly I feel like it's a warm embrace when I'm there. Right. Because as soon as I get off the plane and see Anna Wachu, like, I'm like, wow, I'm here, you know, when I'm soon flying in from Toronto and I get to see Gitchigumi, I get to see Lake Superior and to see all the beautiful land and even, just like you smell the air as soon as you walk out and it's just like, yes, I'm here. And I feel, I feel very connected to the land, to the place, to the city. Um, and, you know, a lot of people would say that, Oh, you hate Thunder Bay. My critics would say that. And that's couldn't be the furthest thing from no. the truth. You know, I, I love, I love it. And um, I love the people that are there, all the people that are there, you know, and you just can't help once you're in Thunder Bay seeing the disparity and the divide and how our people coming in from a lot of the treaty nine communities um, and other Robinson superior uh, communities for services, for basic services. You can't, you can't unsee that, you know, all of our people that are there looking for work, looking for a high school education, looking for, medical care just basic medical care because we don't have that in our communities in the north it's um there's a divide there you know and there's also there's also there's a hardness yes but there's also a beauty there's a beauty mm -hmm. of all of our people being in that one place as well yeah, and I've always found Thunder Bay to be misunderstood, especially by people who've never been to Thunder Bay, you know, because we we know that there's so many issues there. But every time I've ever gone to Thunder Bay, it's the warmest, most welcoming, awesome place to be. All the Native people there, no matter what their background is, they're just, yeah. hey, come here, we're going to teach you some Anishinaabeg, and then you will leave and be an Anishinaabeg person. They're constantly <laughs> trying to assist assimilate me and I'm like no you know I know <laughs> we do it in a soft way a soft and yeah, lovely yeah, way yeah. I know because that's how we are but yeah it's um it's a great spot you know and uh, mm -hmm. my mom was actually she was raised in the corner of Treaty 9 and the Robinson Spirit Treaty so the bottom of Treaty 9 uh, so there's mm -hmm. a place called Graham on Ontario, Graham is what they called it. Um, and it's up this road, uh, a logging road, actually. And so that's where she spent um, the beginning part of her life. And then she moved into the traditional territory of uh, Fort William. Um, and so, you know, a lot of my writing, it's around that area, right? It's like all this area uh, where all of the three treaties meet, because uh, Treaty 3 meets right there as well. Um, and it's a place that is filled with such beauty, such untouched, untouched beauty, right? Um, and it's in danger of getting a giant nuclear repository being stuck in the Canadian shield. And it's right there. It's right where the treaties meet. It's right where the Arctic watershed is. Um, and why I'm talking about this is I always try and talk about it because it always, it just destroys me to think that this is where mm -hmm. we're thinking about 
putting this waste. Um, and also too, you know, this, it's such a beautiful, pristine spot. And when I think of Thunder Bay and when I think of the North, I also think of that corridor that goes all the way along um, Superior, um, all along the highway mm. out to Manitoba and how precious that area is, the entire province really, and how a lot of people really don't know about it. It, it is incredible what they don't know about it or how precious that mm -hmm. territory is and how mm -hmm. they, it, you know, it houses this traditional transportation route where we could go, you know, That's from right. nation to nation and, you know, That's in right. multiple directions. And I just, you know, Thunder Bay is a heart, a heart of that kind of hub. And I just, I love it. And I love that you love it too. You know, it's one of those things where, People can say they love something, but in everything you say and everything you do and everything you write, every, you just ooze like that Anishinaabeg Thunder Bay territory. And, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. thankful for that because you and your family and all your probably 8,000 cousins <laughs> represent what's good about First Nations in that territory, right? You know, it's and true. I, I think that's important. <laughs> it's true. My 8,000 cousins, it's so true. <laughs> I got you on that one too. Um, so one of the things that I've always admired most about you is your journalism and the op-eds that you write. I mean, all of your writing, but uh, everything that you used to write in the Toronto Star and now the Globe. Mm -hmm. How did you get into journalism? Is it one of those things when you were a kid and you got out a pen and paper and some glasses and walked around and interviewed people and said, I'm going to be a journalist someday? Or is that part of your education or both? Mm, no, I didn't go to journalism school. So thanks for asking that question. But I, I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, I always wanted to tell stories. It was a dream of mine since I was a little girl. And, you know, um, I never... I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it, right? It's like, you know, and when you tell your parents that you want to be a writer... Um, they kind of look at you like you are kind of crazy because they're like, well, how are you going to eat if you want to be a writer? And um, my father, of course, who I mentioned was uh, Polish Canadian, he wanted me to be a pharmaceutical salesman because that's what he was. And he said, you know, it's, it's you can get good money, you get a car, you can travel, you set your own hours. And I was like, no, dad, I really don't want to do that. And I always told my mom I wanted to write, you know, and she was always so incredibly supportive of me, but also kind of fearful because she's like, okay, well, how are you going to eat? Well, good luck with that. Um, but I sort of fell into journalism um, when I was at university. Um, I went to U of T and when I was there in doing my undergrad, I only have one degree, my undergrad, um, scraped through, I fell into journalism. I went to a meeting and I started to write stories. I wrote my first story was a sports story. Uh, which was absolutely horrendous. It was horrible. I had to, it was like, a, I had to interview people about intramural sports. It was crazy. Um, and I was terrified about talking to anybody as well, like going up and speaking to people. I was always so incredibly shy. It was really hard to do. But I kept going to those meetings and I kept learning. Um, you know, I took different assignments and I started to love it. And I realized that I could make money by writing stories that I could freelance stories. Um, and it was all the things I love to do. I could talk to people, I could write down their stories, I could take photographs. Um, so then I actually ended up at the varsity and became the news editor of the varsity. Um, Naomi Klein was there when I started. Wow. I know I was like, that's how old wow. I how old we both are. <laughs> Me and Naomi, you're not old. But anyway, no. so yeah, so she was there. Um, and um, we learned from each other, you know, mm -hmm. I think we learned from each other how to, to write, because at that point, there was no journalism school or classes at uh, U of T. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, nothing like that. Um, I was there a long time ago. I was there, you know, um, universities have changed a lot. Um, and maybe not, you would be the better, to, you know, person to, to talk about that. But 
Um, when I was there, it was pretty still really massively colonial place. Right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's a whole other story. Um, and so I jumped from there. Um, I worked, like I graduated, did the whole, like worked in retail, um, wasn't sure if I was actually going to be able to be a writer. And then I managed to get an internship um, at the Toronto Star. And that's how I got into mainstream journalism. And I remember there were 10 interns hired that summer, and I was the only one that didn't go to journalism school. Um, and I know it was pretty, I know it was um, pretty exciting. I know, yay. Uh, I was. But that I felt I had to prove myself, right? I had no family connections. There were no, there were no natives in the newsroom. Like they were mostly British, um, you know, Irish, Scottish, and they were running the news desk. They were running the content of what was going into the paper. Um, it was, it was hard, you know. There, there wasn't an appetite whatsoever for any stories on First Nations people, like. It was it was hard. Um, and at the beginning, I felt like I had to just get my foot in the door and keep it in the door. Um, so I learned how to do everything. I learned how to copy edit. I learned how to write, you know, crime stories, political stories, wow. health stories, like a whole nine yards. Right. Um, and then I kept thinking to myself, you know, when you get better and better, you're going to be able to pitch your own stories. You're going to be able to um, to sort of make people make your editors agree with you that this is a story and this is not a story. And that was easier for me once I got to Queens Park and became a, a reporter there that I got to write about our stories a lot more because I was in a bureau with um, mostly they were all men, uh, male parliamentary reporters at the Toronto Star, and they loved their work. They were totally into the political game. And I wanted to write stories about our people. So those are the stories I pitched and that's when um, it's a long story, but that's when I um, started writing about the seven students in the North and murdered and missing women as well and water wow. um, and everything else. So like 20 years at the Toronto star, unless that's a typo, two decades at the Toronto writing for the Toronto star. Um, yeah. And clearly writing about everything of all the things you've written. And I know this is usually the worst question for people. Like when I ask, you know, other people of all your 500 books, which is your favorite, but of all the things you wrote about at the Toronto star, cause I know you're an award winning journalist. You won awards when you were there. Um, is there any, is there like a couple of stories that really stand out to you as something that you're most proud of or you thought was the most urgent and kind of impactful story? Hmm. Uh, well, right off the bat, easy. There was a story that I wrote in, oh my goodness, um, May 2011. And that was a story about the disappearance of Jordan Wabas. Um, who was a grade nine student from Webakwe First Nation. And he had been missing for several months. Um, and I had gone up north to write a story on um, why it is our people don't vote in federal elections. That's the story I pitched. I was at the Parliamentary Bureau, the Legislative Bureau. And so there was an election happening. So I pitched a story on why it is our people don't vote. I, of course, knew that if you're a status Indian in this country, you didn't receive the right to vote until 1960. So I was like, you know, cheating a bit. But when I pitched that story in 2011, my my editor thought it was exotic, right? They thought it was a great idea because at that point, there was no... Um, there was no social media like there wasn't you didn't have I don't know more. The TRC hadn't reported. It was a far different time in Canada. Um, and so, like, believe it or not. And that's just 2011. And so when I pitched the story, she's like, oh, it's exotic. Why don't you go do that? So I did. I went up north and um, intent on writing that story. And instead, I wrote a story about a missing grade nine student. And that story led me well. When I was researching that story, I found that there were other, six other students that had died while trying to get a high school education, uh, First Nation students. And that story appeared on the front page of the Star in May 2011. 
And mm -hmm. that is the story I think that um, I know it's like, it changed me it um, for sure. Um, and I'm still writing about that issue. I'm still writing about the lack of high schools, proper education for our children in our communities. I'm still writing about the lack of, of health care, of doctors, of clean water, um, and about what, what is happening to our people in the streets of Thunder Bay. Because they're, of course, as everyone knows, um, we're still dying in Thunder Bay. Yeah. So that story for sure has been uh, a touchstone for me. Um, it led to um, five years later, I started uh, writing the book, Seven Fallen mm -hmm. Feathers. Um, you know, and in that period, I was like raising my kids. I was a single parent and it was like, um, it, was, it was hard. And so that's why it took me so long to write the book. Um, and I remember I, I told that to Alvin Fiddler and I apologized to him when I said, I want to write the book now and I feel guilty about not doing it before. And he's like, it's okay. You know, you weren't meant to write the book then, but you're meant to write it now. Um, and then that book led to all our relations. And so, and then you asked me about a second, like, you know, the stories that are mm -hmm. stick with you. Um, stories on Ralph Rowe uh, that I also wrote in 2010, 2011. And uh, Ralph Rowe uh, is a notorious pedophile. Um, it's upwards of, Anishinaabe Eski Nation believes there's probably around 500 to 600 victims of his um, in the North. Oh. He was a flying Anglican priest who spent 20 years going into our nations um, and abusing boys. So I wrote a bit about him too, quite a bit about him. Um, and also too, I think if you ask me um, a story about um, girls that are taking their lives, young girls taking their lives, mm -hmm. um, Poplar Hill First Nation. Um, yeah, Amy Owen, wow. the story of Amy Owen. She was 12 mm -hmm. and her friends. Hard to imagine hard to imagine. And there's ones that are younger. And, you yeah. know, one of the things reading the Toronto Star to, to actually see a story written by a Native person on the front page that wasn't a non-Native reporter covering a protest or yeah. a non-Native reporter covering, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. we're all, we're only ever in the paper if it was something like super serious and it's always in a negative light. Yeah. And here it is a native person from your own voice and your own experience on the front page and really bringing attention to that. And I just thought, mm -hmm. you know, that's, I feel like things are changing when, mm -hmm. and an indigenous woman, I might add, because mm -hmm. even in academia, when there was indigenous people, it was almost all indigenous men in the beginning. So mm -hmm. having indigenous women in these positions who can write about law or politics or mm -hmm. any of these things that are urgent, um, really, really impressive. And so 20 years at the Toronto Star, writing these really impactful articles, what made you go to the Globe? I mean, obviously the Globe and Mail has like massive readership mm -hmm. uh, and it's not, I guess, probably more national in scope. Oh no, um, there's, there's a story behind why I, I did that. Um, okay. Yeah. It's, uh, so um, I finished seven and um, when I finished seven, I applied and uh, received the Atkinson Fellowship in Public Policy. And it's this great time. You get a whole year to spend working on one issue. And um, that story of Amy Owen and her uh, friends that sadly all took their lives. Um, I wanted to look into why it is our children are taking their lives at their own hands, you know. Um, in such large numbers. And so I was on this Atkinson Fellowship, and then I was asked to uh, be the Massey Lecturer for the CBC. Um, and then that's where the other book, All Our Relations, came from. Um, and it was a look at, it was a look at genocide. The book became a book firmly about, you know, the violent separation of our people from the land and what that trauma looks like, you know, the residential schools, the Indian hospitals, the asylums, everything. Um, so it was, it was a big book. And, you know, uh, during this time too, um, after I did the, um, 
Atkinson Fellowship and then the book, I was writing a column. I became a columnist at the Star. And so I got to write for the national section. And I remember being out for lunch. John Hondrick, who was the publisher of the paper, asked me out for lunch. And um, he sat across from me and he said, like, you know, I don't know how you do it. You've become the leader of a movement. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of, well, I don't think so. But that's, thanks for saying that, I guess. Um, and he goes, I just don't know how you've got the time being a columnist for us and also um, doing all the other things that you're doing, like the speaking you're doing and um, just a trajectory of what you seem to be accomplishing. Um, and he said, you know, the paper is going to be offering a buyout coming up. Um, maybe you should think about taking it. And during the course of that lunch, he also looked at me and he said, you know, I feel that we're friends and I could tell you things and we could talk. And I said, yes, you know, for sure. You know, I'd been an employee at his paper for 20 years. And he looked at me and he said across the table, it's not genocide. And I remember getting this feeling, yeah, um, like I was going to throw up. Right. And then I just remember smiling and saying, I disagree with you. And at the time too, there was, um, uh, the MMIW report had just come out and I don't know if you remember, but there was, uh, the Toronto star did, um, um, an op-ed saying, no, it's not genocide, you know, and so did the globe. And that was like, I was at the press conference, um, when Marion Buller was like telling the national media, because the national media pounced on her, like, you know, as soon as that uh, she came out with a report about this is genocide and like, it was awful. Like I remember that so clearly. And, and so when John had said that to me, it was very apparent to me that I was not, I was being pushed out the door at the star to be honest with you. Wow. And so I left, um, you know, I remember speaking to Murray about it um, and Murray Sinclair. Um, and I spoke to Alvin Fiddler, you know, Tisa, just like my good friends. And I'm like, this is like, this is happening. And it's, and I remember, I think it was Tisa that said, you know what, you have to go anyway. It's not a safe space for you there. And I'm like, of course, of course, it's not. No, but you know, after everything, no, it's just it was it was it was hard. Um, mm -hmm. But I had started my own company during all this time, and you know that was that was the saving grace, and it was also the advice of Murray Sinclair, who said to me, "We know what to do in our hearts. We know the way forward, right? And we have to rely on that knowledge to get our, ourselves there." and to have that confidence to do it. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I had had the two books behind me. Uh, <laughs> I took the buy out and I just uh, never really looked back. The Globe, there's a reason why. Um, when I left the star and everything else, like, you know, um, I remember um, someone said to me uh, from up north, um, well, who's gonna tell our stories now? And the Globe had offered me um, a column gig. And I said to the Globe, okay, I, I, I would, I'll do it, but I'll only do it twice a month um, and I'll be freelance if that's all right. Um, because I learned that um, I need to work for myself and I want mm -hmm. to do what uh, Murray Sinclair said in the TRC and um, we have to build our own systems our own companies, we have to employ our own people. Um, we need to make our own way, build our own systems. And so that's why I write at the Globe to be in the faces of people who would not read me every two weeks. Uh, amazing. There's always a story when I ask someone, why did you leave this company that you're up for so long? And then they, they're they honest and they share, well, here's what they were doing about Native issues or here's what they said or here's how they treated someone. It's almost always something like that. There's always something behind it. So good on you for, you know, obviously talking to our people, but 
coming to what was probably a really hard decision. And yeah. I know like we don't, we never know what's going on behind the scenes necessarily. Yeah. So we don't yeah. know. And then, you know, it's hard. Say, yeah. It's hard. You know, as um, like I mentioned, you know, I was a single parent. Um, I didn't have like, I didn't know a lot of, I didn't have like this, this group of people, uh, you know, behind me that could like really say, Hey, you know, we'll support you economically and financially. Um, but I had my books I had my writing, S you know, my communities supported me really. Right. Yeah. And gave me this opportunity to form Makwa, Makwa Creative. And I'm so grateful that I did and I'm still, still doing it. Right. Um, but yeah, it was a really, it was a really fascinating lesson. You know, I've always said that the racism in Canada is really quite subtle, right? It's quiet, especially in institutions, like in universities, in media. Yeah. It's always like, well, we don't really want too much of that story, right? Or we don't really, we don't want you screaming too loud. <laughs> or, you know, we don't want you to like, what did I, I was like, would you get her off that story? Will you tell her to start writing other things, you know? Um, and I'm sorry, like once you open the door, like once mm -hmm. you open that door and you walk through it, you can't look back. Like you cannot not write about what's going on in Thunder Bay yeah. at Fort William mm -hmm. or, you know, Treaty 9 communities or what's happening all over, right? You just can't not. Um, I couldn't. Well, clearly. And, and so, you know, that's a good segue into talking about your books because they're, I mean, they're, they're all their own project, but obviously they're inherently connected to everything, yes. our history, our current. So can you tell us a little bit about Seven Fallen Feathers for anyone who hasn't read it? Like just, you know, kind of summarize what was the, mm. well, you know, the impetus behind it and what, what's in the book? What can we find? Oh, my gosh, for that. Um, so, like when I was talking earlier about that uh, story that was in May 2011 uh, that appeared on the front page of the star, you know, good for them for doing that, about the um, Jordan was um, missing at that point. He had not... Um, had not been found and um it was the other six students that had died i wanted to write about what was going on what the hell was happening in thunder bay um and i was also ashamed that i wasn't writing more about this and i wasn't paying attention to it i felt bad about that that i was letting down my people and everyone else and i knew too that i couldn't get across what was happening in thunder bay um in newspaper articles because they were too short i knew i had to write about everything i had to write about the indian act i had to write about the formation of canada i had to write about um, the treaties and uh, what had happened to our people about the othering of our people um, and that became seven fallen feathers um, there was an inquest into the deaths of the seven students 145 recommendations came out um, it's still a work in progress. Very few have been implemented. And I have to say that the recommendations from seven, a lot of them mirror the um, TRC, 94 Calls to Action. They also mirror what you could find with the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. Um, you know, basic human rights. Seven Fallen Feathers is a book about basic human rights we don't have them for our people we're still fighting for them um i wish i didn't have to write seven i really yeah. wish i didn't right but i did um and that's what the book's about and i wanted people to see to the students um as people as children mm -hmm. who are loved yeah. you know communities that love them who had families that loved them and that they are remembered i wanted people to know that they are just like everyone else's children we are all the same like you know it's i wanted to really bring that home and so that's what seven is about and for me when it came out seven fallen feathers obviously we knew exactly what it was about i was really emotionally worried about reading this book you know um but uh, if you haven't read it already 
to all the listeners or viewers or closed caption readers, you really do have to read it because knowing the children in a, like in a good way and family and community and territory, that's really important. Like there's, we need to know that. And I'm so glad that you, you did that and showed the humanity of them, uh, which, you know, basically I think that was in 2017 and it was only a year later. And I don't know how you did this. Some kind of bizarre (laughs) magic uh, outcomes your other book, um, All Our Relations. Can you mm-hmm. talk about that one? Because that was another really important, impactful book that Canadians raved about, Native people raved about, um, and so yeah. close on the backs of seven. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I feel, uh, yeah, it's true. Very close on the backs of seven. I, I had five months to write All Our Relations. It was... <laughs> insane it was just totally it was crazy i know um but i'm very deadline oriented so it actually was probably really good that they said okay you've only got these five months to do this but the truth of the matter is is that um someone else was chosen as the massey lecturer and they crapped out and so they asked me to do it and so i was kind of the massey lecturer by default and when you do the massey lectures you write a book And so that was the five months that I had to write all our relations. And um, as I was mentioning, I was um, on the Atkinson Fellowship and I was looking at why our children are dying at their own hands. And especially the story of the suicide pact that, uh, um, you know, Kanina, Sue Turtle, um, Amy Owen, so many of the girls um, from northwestern Ontario and what was behind that why was it happening right and it became a book on genocide and it became a book on um, not just in our communities um, our First Nations communities but also um, what was going on in um, in uh, Kaluit and in Nunavut what was going on because they have the same issues are there as well um, in Brazil in the Sami lands, um, in um, Alaska, you can see uh, where our people, where indigenous people are removed from the land, are put into boarding schools, residential schools, Indian hospitals, where language is taken away. There's a split of the spirit, right? It's a trauma that just runs so deep. Um, and that is all our relations. And um it was um, it was really tough to write that book for sure, um, but it came out. You know, um, I often I don't know about you too, uh, Pam, but like I think about things for a long time. Mm-hmm. A lot of things are in my brain for a long time, and then sometimes when you sit and you write, they all just start to come out. <laughs> and so I feel like that's was sort of guiding me um, very much with that with that book. Well, and and five months. And I didn't know that about Massey Lectures. Maybe I should have, but I didn't realize that if you take it on, you must write an accompanying book. And I think yeah. about, you know, five months, pretty compressed time to to write a book. And then I think about how, you know, there's some of my colleagues I know, they dedicate an hour every day in their office and they're writing a part of their book and then they put it away. I've never, ever been able to write on a big project like that. I'm like, I can't write for two months and then for two weeks, I am 18 hours a day, not sleeping or eating. And then, okay, I need a break. Yeah, that's me. That's exactly me, you know? And yeah, that's exactly how I write too. And I remember my editor, Janie Yoon at the time for all our relations, she was going out of her mind. She's like, you have five months. What are you doing? How how come you haven't written this yet? You're supposed to write this many hours a day. And I'm like, I can't work like that. You just don't understand. I just don't. And I do the same as you. It's just like, and then when it starts, like you can't turn it off, right? It's like, it's a tap and it just goes. Yeah. Yeah. You can edit later, but all yes. the, all the mad scientist work has to happen now. Mad scientist work, It's true. It's true. It's yeah. So and mad. also too, like, you know, I had the body of work that I'd done at the star too. That was lucky as well. Well, lucky, but it's like, it was, it's all kind of my life's work, right? I just keep going with it and just keep moving. <laughs> which is, uh, which is incredible in and of itself. And so now there is an amazing book 
called The Knowing coming mm. out. And we have to wait until August. I pre-ordered it online and they're like, you can't have it till August 27th. And I was like, no, but I am very excited because time goes by. Talk about The Knowing. Mm. What made you write this book and uh, what's in it? Mm, Miigwech. This is another big one. This is uh, uh, all, I don't know, they're all hard, aren't they? Um, when you write a book, but this one really uh, sort of took the stuffing out of me. Um, it was difficult. Um, I started off with writing a book on residential schools and why it is um, why it is there's so many children that are gone and never made it home. Um, precursor to that, when I pitched Seven Fallen Feathers as a book um, way back in 2016, um, I pitched two books. I pitched this one that I've just finished and I pitched seven. Um, and my editor at the time, Janie, she said, write Seven Fallen Feathers uh, first and then go back and do the knowing. Um, the TRC had just come out and the fourth volume of the TRC concerned uh, the missing children. And that's the book that I started to write a few years ago. Well, actually, you could probably say it's always been with me, the knowing. Um, it's something that I have always wanted to do. It's um, I started to write about the children. And then I just got in my own head. I started to go in a different direction. I started to realize that, um, as my elder Sam Achipanenskum always says to me, you have to tell people who are telling the story and you have to tell people um, who you are, where you're from. And I did that for the knowing. I realized that I couldn't go and write a story, a book about all of our collective pains and traumas and everything else. Um, and I was also really mad. I've been mad about this. You know, I've just been angry. It's like, what happened? How the hell did this happen to us? How did this happen to our people? Where did this all come from? What is behind this genocide? I was thinking about all these things. And then I realized that I needed to start the book with where it all began. And that is actually with uh, my great, great grandmother, Annie. Annie Carpenter. She was five years old when the Indian Act was put in place. Um, she was born in 1871. And um, she was born just after Canada was formed, after the sale of Rupert's land to John, John A. MacDonald. Um, and she had, she was missing um, in my family. Um, we didn't know a thing about her. We knew her name was Annie and that she was in, um, she disappeared into the hospital system. Um, we had her death certificate that said she was in an unmarked grave just outside of Toronto, actually in Toronto. And so I started the book with looking for her and looking for why it is my great grandma who raised my mother. Her name was Liz. Why she never spoke about her past. Why uh, she went to residential school, came out God-fearing, hating herself, hating her language, everything about who she was. And she raised my mother. Um, so my family had always been searching for who Annie was and who Liz was. Who was Liz? What happened to her? at the schools. Did she have any siblings? Did she have any family at all? Her life was this giant mystery like this. We had no idea. Um, and did I have all this other family out there that we didn't know about? My uncle Hank, who is, um, he's, he's now, he's no longer with us, but he started this. He used to carry around this brown filing folder that had all this information in it. It had baptism records, it had marriage records, it had maps of First Nations in Northern Ontario, the circled things. He wrote letters to everybody. Um, and the government of Canada told him that his, uh, his mom, Liz, and his grandma, Annie, did not exist, um, both as people or as First Nations women. 
And so he was hell bent on trying to make sure that wasn't the case. Um, and when he died, he was a veteran of World War II. Um, he died in the, I think it was in the early 2000s. Um, I inherited his brown filing folder. Um, and so I started to do a deep dive into who was Liz, who was Annie, where are their family members, where are they from? It was a giant mystery. We had this, like, you know, there was a joke in our family um, that uh, Liz was Cree and <laughs> so was Annie. And that's all we knew. That's all we knew. So I started to look and see what I could find. And of course, my uncle Hank was searching before the internet as well. Um, mm -hmm. And so I had the ability to start working with researchers and archivists. Um, I've been a journalist for 20 years, but I needed high level help. I needed the help of Kim Murray's office. I needed the help mm -hmm. of uh, No History, which is a, an archivist group based in Ottawa. Yeah. They're working for the Survivor Secretariat now. Um, Library Archives Canada, the NCTR. I needed all this help. And so all of these people marshaled and helped me find Annie um, and find her gravesite. And her, she's buried, believe it or not, um, off of the Gardner Expressway, just south of the giant Ikea on the way to Sherway Gardens. Um, nice. And she's in a grave with 1,511 people that, um, yeah, that all went to a place called the Ontario Hospital. The Ontario Hospital is now Humber College, um, the Lakeshore campus. And the Ontario Hospital was a psychiatric institution they called it the, um, it became the uh, Mimico Insane Asylum. Um, there were, every province had um, an asylum. And they, our people are in those places, just like the Indian hospitals, just like the TB sanatorium. This is where you'll find our people. Um, and to make a very long story short, the knowing. Um, I retraced where Annie was from. And turns out Annie was born in Fort Albany, Petabic. Um, and oh. she went all the way down the river. And I traced her life, um, her daughter Liz, um, her life, so my great grandma, um, and then her children. All of the aunties, cousins, I took certain, you know, um, I went in certain directions looking for the children that were lost. Um, I found that Annie was at the 1905 signing of Treaty Number no. 9 in Osnaburg, which is Mishkigagamang, with Duncan Campbell Scott. Wow. Yeah. He signed one treaty. Duncan Campbell Scott did one treaty. It was Treaty 9. And the first signing was in 1905. Um, and Annie was there. And she was there with a daughter that I didn't know about. Her name was Christina. And uh, Christina was actually taken away. And um, um, she was put in Elkhorn Indian Residential School on the Manitoba, Saskatchewan border. So that is the knowing. The knowing is, um, that's a very short synopsis of it. But I, in retracing the steps of Annie, and about what happened to her as an Indigenous woman, as an Inanu woman who got um, lived through the mouth of genocide, right? Like the Indian Act. Um, she had five children taken away from her. Oh. Like, it was awful. It's, you know, it's a book about survival. It's a book about our women, um, about what happens to our women, the choices they make, choices they're forced to make. Um, it's a story about records. Um, and it's also a story of Kamloops. I sort of weave in the last three years of what's happened since the discovery of the Lest We Way, the, the missing, the over 200 that were formed, that were found at Kamloops. Um, because I was there as a journalist as well. Um, when that happened, um, I got a call from, um, to Kamloops to Shwetma saying, will you come out and tell our story? And that path weaved in with what I was doing with my family. It was just like, led me to find all of these children that we had lost. Um, 
And so that is the knowing. And in doing so, I also retell the story of Canada because we have, you know, have this fictitious story of Canadian history of, of the sale of Rupert's land. I really looked at Rupert's land too, and what was going on there and about, you know, country wives and our women that were 12 and 13 years old mm -hmm. and were um, married off to some guy from Europe that was smelly and, you know, 30 years older than her. And we have this like ver version of Canadian history of they were country wives you can't tell me a, a young First Nations girl was no. excited to leave her family. It was horrible. It was the beginning of trafficking. It was the beginning of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And I felt that that story needed to be told. Um, and slavery as well. There were so many Indigenous slaves. And we don't talk about that. And we don't talk about the fact, too, when Canada was being formed and the people that ran Rupert's Land, they all have connections to the slave trade. They're all from, they were all, um, you know, board members, business associates with the ANC, with the Africa, you know, National uh, Committee. They were working. They were the beginning of the slave trades. And those ideals came to Canada. Those ideals are behind the Indian Act. They are behind the treaty system, like, you know, with the with the reserves about the othering of our people. Um and so the knowing, I, I kind of rewrite Canadian history uh, through First Nations lens. And I tell the story of, it's a big book. It's a, <laughs> it's a hard book. It really, it really knocked me to the ground. It was, it was hard to do. As I imagine, all of your books have been hard to do, but one that's going to be so powerful. It's like, it's your own personal story of your family, but also... It's all of our story. Like, that's the thing. Right. It's not, you're right. not an exception where we're going, no, wow, no, can you imagine no, no, no. this happened? It's exactly. All exactly. Of us. Exactly. And that's, I'm so glad you said that because that's the reason why I wrote this book too. And when I talk about this book, because I have been of, you know, um, bringing this book to communities to, um, I was at um, Moose Cree First Nations. Um, IRS gathering in Timmins and I spoke about Annie and about our, you know, our connections. Mm. Um, I've been to Petabic, Fort Albany, um, as well, Thunder Bay a number of times talking about this with our people, the Six Nations Survivor Secretariat as well. Um, it's all of our stories. And if every single one of us was to tell our story, to write our story, was to be able to go back into our history and show how connected we actually all really are. You know, we have these First Nations communities, 634 of them, but we're so much more than that. That is like, you know, we're people of the land and of the river. And if you look back, you'll see the families all interconnected. It's incredible. So if every one of us were given the opportunity to write their own version of the knowing, we could all rewrite Canadian history and we could change the narrative of this country. And I really, truly believe that that's what we have to do as, as a people, every one of us, you know, and we're all like, we're going at the GPR thing right now. We're looking at searching for our lost children. I really do think <clears throat> the way to do it is this way. It's like, go backwards. Find your story. Uh, exactly. Because you cannot possibly understand the current context without knowing right. how we got there and that exactly. the past has never ended. That's right. You know, that's like right. that's so important. I, I cannot wait to read this book. It's going to be amazing. I, yeah. In addition to all of this, you also have your own Indigenous production company. Hello, that's Indigenous right. Woman heading an indigenous production company. Can you yeah. tell me some of the things that Makwa Creative does? For sure. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, my wee little company. Um, we are um, really proud to have, we're five years old now, um, which I really can't believe. Um, and we just, yay. Yeah, we started off with uh, Spirit to Soar, which was a documentary. It was a mid-length, around 46 minutes. Um, and it was about why, uh, well, what's happened in Thunder Bay since the inquest into the deaths of the seven students. Um, you can see it on CBC Gem. It's still there. Um, and um, that process led me to wanting to 
to do more definitely. And also too, I learned so much. I, you know, I was writing, I was directing. Um, it was like, I was picking people up. I was booking their hotels. I was writing the story. It was just, I learned right from the ground how to try and do this. Um, and it became to like what Murray Sinclair had told me is so important that we be in the driver's seat, being there in the room, making these decisions. You know, it's good to be directors. It's good to be writers and everything else. But where the power is, is in the producing. It's in the ones, you know, that actually owns the the film and who is can make the decisions surround it. And that's important for us. It's important for our um, owning intellectual property that way. You know, we talk a lot about data sovereignty, and that's why. Um, so, Spirit to Soar, Makwa owns Spirit to Soar. Yay! You know, and we have a fully, uh, we have a fully versioned um, in language, Mashkawi, um, Manaduba, um, Medisawin, as well. Um, so we did that. And we've also done War for the Woods, which was an episode of The Nature of Things with David Suzuki. Um, yeah, and it's all about um, it's all about Kleaquat Sound and what has happened in uh, the last 40 years and about clear cutting in um, in BC. Um, and that was uh, that was something the new Chalice people really helped us. Um, it's I'm very proud of that. Um, that. We made it a film. Um, we, you know, took off the little um, um, David Suzuki stuff, the uh, the nature <laughs> of things bumpers, and we just sort of put it together as a little film too. Um, and so that's also on CBC and CBC okay. Gem. And so then we did uh, Anti Up. We're in our third season of Anti Up. So Kim Wheeler is producing yeah. that. And Karen Puglazi is actually working on it as well. And so we're going to be having new episodes hopefully come out next oh hopefully this month hoping this month um yeah because it's important for me to amplify indigenous women um and it's also it's not a vehicle you know for for me to to be out there and talking it's for everyone else it's like we have guest hosts um we have um so many uh, people behind the scenes working on it as well and i'm really super proud of anti up um, Anna Mickey helps sponsor it as well. And so does No History. Um, and we're fully funded, you know, which is also great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need that gig. <laughs> <laughs> I need that gig. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, so wow. there's that. And now we're also, Makwa is also, uh, we've got a film called Not a Modest, um, that Shane Belcourt is, um, he is directing for us and it's on Anasnabe Park. Um, oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, something that's been, um, I've wanted to tell the story for a very long time. And so Shane is directing that for us. It'll be a 90 minute feature doc. Um, and we're doing a four part documentary on the knowing actually. Yeah. So wow. the book and the documentary, there's a series that's coming out on it as well. Um, and it's yeah it's it's crazy um so that's wow. happening and sip it'll be september oh my gosh so yeah. in august we get the book in september we get the series which is fantastic so when i opened this podcast i, I didn't know all of this extra stuff and when i was saying you're a native woman on fire wow i don't know what you call this like uh, <laughs> a massive fire like this is a well, big bonfire. Like, no, wow. Or just like, I don't know. It's like, I, uh, I don't sleep much. <laughs> but, it's like, <laughs> but yeah, that's so exciting. And full disclosure for our listeners, there's this amazing person on anti up. I actually got to be a guest on anti up because we were talking about really important topics, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls, but it's how I came to know anti up. And I just love it because it feels like a kitchen table and native women all sitting around it. And that, you know, the podcasting world needs that because there's enough ones with guys, you know, know. sitting around talking about hockey or sitting around talking about women, you know, Uh, this one, is how we actually relate to one another literally sitting at a table on the res drinking tea talking about stuff like this it's not formal it's like legit authentic voices and i think that's what i love most about it and knowing that it's being all produced and hosted by native women 
Yeah, for sure. You know, and it's it's owned by Makwa. It's like a, a, a female. I'm a native woman owning this. This yeah. It's that's why I did it. Like you know, it's just we got to do this. And uh, yeah, it's um and Kim Wheeler. There's a long backstory as to yeah. why we started it as well, which is a whole other whole other podcast. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> it was an idea that came about. Uh, and Kim kind of looked at me. She goes, "Well, you own a company. You you know, let's let's do this." And like so, yeah. So it. It's amazing. I'm just grateful that I uh, can't say enough great things too about Kim and yourself as well. Leaders mm -hmm. in this, this area, this field of podcasts with our women. It's, you know, and like holding the reins and making the decisions. That's the important part. It's like, we don't work yeah. for somebody else. They work for us. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And just knowing that I can have people on my podcast, just people I want to know, I want to talk to, 100%. I want the world to know. I don't have to do it. A producer saying, oh, well, you have to have balance. Make sure you invite this yep. person and this, yep. like everyone yep. on here is people I love. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. I'm, yeah, I have to say, I'm just really fangirling over the fact that you asked me to um, be on your show because you are the star you are, you know, you are a warrior. You do lead the warrior life. And I don't know where we'd be without you and your voice. Oh, oh. and true. I didn't pay her to say any of this. Thank you <laughs> so much, true. Tanya. This is awesome. Um, I can't thank you enough. It, and I guess I'd love to end it on, you know, two things. Do you have any wisdom for indigenous youth who often struggle mm -hmm. and say, I've had a difficult time, so I can't be a superstar like they are. And one of the things mm -hmm. I love most about our people is we show, hey, look, we had struggles and we had difficulties and we made a ton of mistakes mm -hmm. and we can still be doing these amazing things. Do you have any advice for those young Indigenous yeah. people who listen to this podcast and say, oh, I don't know if I can do that, but I've always wanted to be a writer? Yeah, sure you can. Just never give up never give up. And it's going to get hard. And you can't start at the top to write like you do have to start at the bottom and like volunteering your time to write something for a campus newspaper that no one's going to read or an, a pamphlet or something. <laughs> but you got to do it and you have to go through the motions. There's no fast way there. You know, if you're gonna to do it right, you have to go through your hoops. You have to learn what you're doing, learn your trade, right? Like do it, keep writing, keep a book at home, write stories, write journals, read everything you possibly can. And don't take no for an answer, you know, like pound on doors and say, take my resume. You know, my name is, you know, I don't know, um, Debbie George, and I am from such and such a nation. And I write, and these are my, this is an examples of my work. And here's my resume. Find out who you need to get those resumes to deliver them. Don't give up, you know, and you'll feel there'll be times where you, you think you can't do it anymore. And those are the times you're waitressing or you're, you know, working retail or everything else just to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Keep going and keep doing it. Right. Keep doing it. Exactly. And there's more of us now in positions that can hire and, and we will. Yeah. And I think of all the mentorship opportunities. Uh, and then our final question for you is one for all the Canadian listeners on all of these issues. Is there something in particular that Canadians can do to help in, in any way? Hmm. Of course, you know, um, always be kind be that person that voice in the room when you're at the you know the the table or it's a holiday gathering and somebody says something that's really racist against a native person stand up and say that's actually not okay and um let me tell you a little bit about the history and know your history read um educate yourself you know just it's it's basic um the NCTR has little tiny books with 94 calls to action uh, that I know that they will give out. Write those calls to action down. If every person, I know it's like Murray always says this, takes one call and makes that about your life, you're going to help change this country. And I really do believe that to be true. And also, I'm just a tiny little plug. Um, I have um, um, Spirit to Soar Fund. It's a charity that um, we started when we did the documentary 
Um, wow. And uh, yeah, so Canadians, if you're listening to this, please donate. Go to the Make Way um, organization page, you can see, or, or go to my page, makwacreative.ca, and you'll be able to see um, information on how you can donate. Um, and we are currently raising funds to build um, safe houses in Treaty 9 communities. Wow. Okay. I'll definitely post that link, especially to just to make it easy for people to find it in, either in the podcast show notes or in the YouTube video version when that comes out. Wow. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for all the time you took. Thank you for the great advice, the encouraging words to me and to everybody that's listening. Can't thank you enough, Tanya. Oh, Miigwech. You know, honestly, the honor's mine. Um, the more of us that stand up and tell our stories, we're going to push us all up. We're all together. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And thank you to all the listeners on the podcast version. Thank you to all the viewers or closed caption readers and the YouTube version uh, for supporting this podcast, for sharing it widely, using it in your classrooms, just general learning from it. Literally, this podcast is so you can hear all of the voices of all of the people I consider to be warriors across this country who you can learn so much from. So support them, support Indigenous content creators. Thank you so much. Until next time, keep living a warrior life. Wulalia. This podcast was produced by Warrior Life Studios. You can go to our website, warriorlifestudios.com, and check out our other podcasts, documentaries, and TV shows. If you're looking for more information on Indigenous issues, you can also check out my website at pampalmeter.com.